It's a real honor to be on the same stage with Mr. K. V. Kamath. Not only he is one of the major architects of India's financial system, but he is someone who has actually seen the entire economy of India boom over the last couple of decades. Welcome, sir, to the Republic Summit. Thank you. So Thank there, you. there has been never a better time to discuss <laughs> the Indian economy. The Q3 GDP figures are stunning. In, in, despite the global you know, no, turmoil, how is it that India is doing everything right? What are the factors driving our story? Uh, thank you uh, for having me here today. Uh, that's a very interesting question because uh, uh, it has surprised uh, everybody who has observed uh, economic development that you have turmoil in the developing con developed countries, whereas we have bucked the trend. And of course, there's turmoil in other developing countries too. I think this is uh, primarily because of resolute action by uh, A, the government, and B, uh, the regulators, who have uh, played a, an important role in guiding this whole transition through the challenges. First COVID, and then uh, we have had the situation in Europe. And I think we have, uh, and it has taught us something that we, in a way, can get disconnected from what is happening in the West and drive our own agenda. Again, uh, to paraphrase uh, what the Honorable Prime Minister says, Atmanir Bharata. I think Atmanir Bharata is a core component of why we have done as well as we have done to the crisis. I'll give you a data point. I think COVID was a crisis everywhere, but we came out of COVID with probably 25% better productivity at our manufacturing level than we ever had. So I think Indian industry, Indian entrepreneurs, the Indian spirit learn to manage change. And I think we have uh, now, uh, we will not let it go. Right. So the theme of today's summit is Bharat, the next decade. We see the growth map for India charted out pretty well. But what are the factors beyond CapEx which can actually put force behind this growth? Yeah, I think uh, there's a combination of several things that is required to drive uh, this whole thing. And A, primarily there is uh, uh, I would say uh, talent. People need to get uh, together to drive uh, uh, progress. And of course, CapEx follows. And the people equation, as I see, is... Uh, let me just uh, fix this. Uh, yeah. Sorry about that. No, not a problem. The people equation, as I was saying, uh, is, is the key to uh, growth, apart from uh, the CapEx uh, that you uh, mentioned. And there are a whole lot of drivers that uh, we never imagined would propel us. And I would add digital is uh, the third uh, key to our uh, capex in hard infrastructure, capex in manufacturing, digital India, and uh, talent. I think these, I think, put together will drive us uh, forward. Just to put it in context, on the manufacturing front, the large industries now, by and large, can meet their growth aspirations through internal cash generation. That is cash that company throws up every year. It was not so just 20 years back. 20 years back they said, we'll put up one, two will come as debt, no longer. They say that we can put up the entire investment. Infrastructure is where I think most effort is now being put and government leads. And government has been leading, for example, in uh, the road sector, it's entirely government-led. In the rail sector, entirely government-led. But then as you go along to other sectors, let's say telecom, now, private sector is leading. Ports, airports, private sector is leading. Power, again, government and private sector is leading. Green energy, again, uh, I would say joint efforts by government and this. So there is very interesting play that is happening in terms of sectors that need government support or getting government support and government push. The other sectors are encouraged to be driven by private sector. And then comes digital, which we have actually not counted so far. Uh, my assessment is that at this point in time, probably di digital is contributing 8 to 10% of our GDP. In a full, I would say, developed stage, in that stage, given what uh, you know, heard the Honorable Minister say, I think probably it's five years away. A full digital force in India, that should contribute between 20 to 30% uh, of, to the GDP, not of the GDP, to the GDP. Now you're looking at the last number, the 8.4% was the number, and a lot of people are surprised, uh, and most analysts said the number much uh, lower. I was not surprised. I was expecting that number. 
And my own assessment is that the base is now going to be reset. So 8, 8.5% 8 is now going to be the, the base level of growth. And to that I would add uh, that 20, 25% that will come from, uh, uh, from, from uh, digital uh, India. It's all its avatars as it well. Everything, not just digital finance, but the entire digital spectrum. And if you add that 20, 25% to 8, 8.5%, 8 you are well into double digits. Now you are well into double digits, the Viksit Bharat dream comes true because you are compounding every seven years then in terms of uh, your GDP. So four becomes eight, eight becomes 16 in two turns, just two turns. And uh, you are then into a different uh, orbit as it were. So I'm extremely bullish that what we have seen so far is not a flash in the pan. A lot of steps have been taken. Industries have become much more efficient, much more productive. And you know, now they have the full support of the government Interest rates have been kept, uh, you know, I would say, at uh, a very uh, nominal level or attractive level. And you have got a ro growth runway. Because there is so much to be built in India that the 25-year runway, which was first, again, in a way, uh, identified and articulated by the Honorable Prime Minister, appears absolutely something that is doable. As you look around and we can see there is enough effort we need to put in for the next 25 years. Because a lot of growth stories you know, die down or peter away because there is nothing to uh, invest on. But we will have a very long runway to uh, invest on. So I would think that uh, we are on the absolutely right track and uh, we should progress on this track uh, for the foreseeable future. So while we are very bullish on this entire digital story of India, we have recently been you know, uh, witnessing some uh, negativities emerging out of this because of lack of regulation, the entire fintech industry which has tremendous potential, but what do you think to your mind needs to be done so that you know stuff like Paytm doesn't recur in this yeah. country? I won't talk of any companies but uh, let me put it in the regulatory context because we have gone, grown through regulation uh, at least in my career over 50, 52 years but at least last 30 years I've seen it at close quarters. I think the regulator knows the pulse. The regulator has got everything uh, that needs to be regulated out there and is on top of the situation. Now if we have slipped as a company it is a regulator who will point out to us that you have slipped and corrective action has to be taken. And uh, this is true anywhere in the world. We are no different in terms of regulatory action. So if uh, digital businesses find that uh, they probably you know, have not met the expectation of the regulator, it is for them to correct, not for the regulator to ease regulation because regulation is out there for a good purpose and we will have to meet it. And I think business people are smart. They will very quickly course correct read the regulator and do what is right for their companies and for the nation. Banks have done it for all these years. So I don't think there is anything lacking in regulation. Regulation is in sync with what is happening around the world. And I think we will, of course, correct uh, where required. But is there a sort of pressure on the existing banking system because of the fintechs to digitalize very fast? Because a lot of funds are being exhausted by the banks also to go take to the digital route very fast. Indeed. Indeed there is pressure. In fact, uh, I, if I were uh, you know, a CEO of a bank today, I would be scared. I would be scared at the pace of change that is happening. Let's take just, let's not make it into a long this one. Let's take just one piece. Banks made their money on what we called uh, payment transactions. Because in the payment transaction, you had a float. The float, you didn't pay interest. And that was a large part of what you lent and that earned your returns. So that float has virtually vanished. Because with the UPI and uh, the payment system that we have today, it is straight through. So the bank doesn't have a float. So there is disruption in one key area of banking. And of course, then you will look out for what are the other key areas. For example, just one more area, uh, lending. Lending to uh, the retail public. Again, what the Honorable Minister uh, uh, put out earlier in the today, just two sessions back, where he said that common street vendor now gets funding all through a digital platform. So again, uh, the retail side of the business is, I would think, today um, in the hands of digital players. So if the banks don't correct on these two, one, you don't correct on your payment architecture, and B, you don't correct on your retail lending architecture, you are then left with possibly only uh, the corporate. But the corporate also is going to go to the capital market. So banks could be under threat unless they reinvent themselves. But I'm sure they will. So uh, the biggest story out of India's financial, mark are India's financial markets, it's recently hit the fourth level globally and 
But what is this good news for the banks? Because again, people would want to invest more in the markets, so there will be less savings. What is your take on that? So I think uh, savings can be uh, in several ways. Savings could be through a bank account. Uh, so the bank deposits, savings could be through a mutual fund account. And the savings could be through long-term savings, through your pension and or your insurance uh, that you are put in. So, and all these are holistically required, uh, in a holistic way, required for a country to grow. You can't just have bank deposits because the nature of bank deposits is short-term. Short-term doesn't really lend itself to, you know, funding long-term projects. So you have a basic conflict. So for, to lend long-term projects, you require long-term uh, funding. And that comes from pension and uh, insurance and uh, the mutual fund route via the equity and uh, so on. And that's now happening. And that's growing at uh, actually at a pace faster than banks. So this is again a shift that is happening which is good for the country because you'll get the type of funds that you require for growth and not just end up having short-term funds which when you lend for uh, long-term creates an imbalance as it were. Or in banking parlance we call it an ALM mismatch. So I think things are happening in a very holistic way now and uh, which again gives me confidence that 8% plus growth plus, plus is digital uh, should be achievable. So artificial I intelligence is a huge buzzword worldwide, but for the banking system, it's a mix of good and bad because just as a lot of the banking work and interfaces are going to be automated, I believe there will be also job erosions. How is our Indian banking system adapting to AI? You know, it's an interesting question because uh, I thought the same thing uh, 25 years back. So we built uh, a lot of back offices because you said the branch is not going to do the work, the back offices will do the work. And uh, within five years, the branch didn't do the work, we thought the back office would do the work, the back office didn't do the work, it became straight through. Because when you transacted your, uh, you know, what you transacted hit, the, hit your account and then uh, basically the account got squared up. So you did not need, uh, you did not need a back office to do, you know, the work for you. And so this is natural progression. And in all this, the banking employment has not stopped, uh, has not come down, it's only increasing. Banking attrition has not stopped, it is now 20-25%. So you need more people as you go along. And when we imagine in India today, which is uh, a 4 trillion economy, and just imagine it at 8 trillion, your banking needs are not going to double, they are going to probably triple. And then you take one more turn uh, of to, from 8 to 16, you can imagine the sort of change that's required. And the change is, change is not linear. This is just doubling of GDP, but the actual requirement of effort in terms of banking, in terms of technology, people, is probably going to be 3x at each turn. So I think there's going to be a huge uh, driver here. So, so the next decade, I mean, how are Indians going to bank? Because, uh, you know, and... Uh, uh, is it entirely going to be a digital experience? How are we going to become financially inclusive through the digital play? I think it's uh, going to be almost entirely digital. Uh, I can't see anybody going into a branch uh, to withdraw money anymore. It will be a digital experience. Uh, I would dare say that you will not even go to an ATM to uh, withdraw money. Uh, at, we talk of five to seven years from now. Uh, your, your, your wallet is your, uh, your phone is your instrument for uh, transaction. And it is not just banking. The entire financial services play is going to be on this. Whether it's your mutual fund, whether it is your insurance or whether it's your pension, everything will be in your... Uh, and today, actually, you can open a bank account in less than five minutes with just your device. You don't need to go into a bank. So who would want to go into a branch? So any of the... Some of the, I would say, challenges that are there with digital, I think in the next one year will be uh, eased out to make uh, everybody comfortable to use digital. So I see a digital India going future. Mr. KV uh, Kamath is open to one question from Mr. Pai, he has a request for you. So if you can take that question, sir. Uh, this is a question for you. Um, do you think in the next five years, we will have enough surplus and abundance of capital in this country for investments for all sort of businesses? Yeah, Vaughan, that's, that's again a great question. Answer is yes. The answer is yes because you today have clean balance sheets. Corporates have clean balance sheets. 150, the top 150 corporates have no debt in this country. Banks have clean balance sheets. Nowhere in the world, I'll repeat it, nowhere in the world today do you have banks with as clean balance sheets as we. 
NPA is less than half percent, and capital adequacy of 17 to 18 percent. Nowhere. I don't see a, a shortage, particularly when we grow at 8 percent plus. So artificial intelligence, digital India, very good news for the Indian economy, and we are doing a couple of things right. Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for Mr. K.V. Kamala. Thank you. Thank you.